My talk today will be about managed file transfer. The managed file transfer is a Yenlo Labs initiative. We at the Yenlo, we have a labs uh, organization, which is our R&D department. Yenlo by itself, it's an international operating integration specialist and a premier partner of WSO2. And the goal of this managed file transfer project is to simplify integration of files based on WSO2 technology. We now are in the year 2016. We heard a lot of microservices, APIs, uh, SOAP services, integration of services in this conference. But there are still more than 150 million companies worldwide that most of them still use files. So they, of course, use all these RESTful, blah, 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 but files is, most of them, the cornerstone of their enterprise. And these companies, they love their files. They have big files. That's what we've seen in our daily practice, gigabytes of files, some exports from some legacy systems. They have small files, another export from some smaller systems, but then they have a, a lot of files in a folder, millions of files sometimes you have to take care of. Then they have many folders with many files, so you just have to take care of this enormous load of files and so on. And files can be really mean fellows. By that, you have to take care of the encoding of a file. If you look in Stack Overflow, search for encoding and file, you'll find more than 100,000 questions and answers on that. So that seems to be a really a hot topic still. In addition, files in Java, in the Java world, it's even worse. If you Go to Stack Overflow and look for Java and file. You'll find more than 200,000 questions all around files and how to take care of files, how to open files, how to close files, how to stream files. And files are even meaner, as there's quite often business semantics in the file name, for instance, as an example. You have a date in there. You have sometimes a three-letter, a three-digit encrypted customer number in the file. You have to take care about the file name size, the ending has some semantics, and the file systems by themselves and their idiosyncrasies, they are mean fellows too in terms of they quite often differ in, in their permission schema, in their locking schema, in their locking uh, semantics, and even in concurrency, how they behave with concurrent access. One example of this really challenging um, yeah, challenging stuff with, with files is when can a file get considered as being able to be processed? In this setup, we have an example of a, a writer process, some program writing a file, an export from a legacy system as an example, and we have some other component as a reader. And the question is, when can this reader really read that file? Can it do it when it's visible in the file system? And that's a bad idea because you're not sure if that file is written already, it's done. So you, you can use some atomic operations offered by the file system, like a move command. By that you can move it in, an oper in a kind of atomic operation. By that when it's visible, then you can be assured the file is done. You can introduce some file name conventions, like abc.xml still writing, and when it's still writing, you are not allowed to read it until it's done, and then you change it to abc.xml. But this requires that the writer has the capability of changing that file name and introducing this file name convention. Another one is to introduce a lock file. By that you add a second companion to that file, like abc.xml has an abc.lock file. And when the file is written or processed or released, then you remove the lock, and the other process can be aware of that and can continue. Another option is, for instance, file size delta. You look in a at a specific point in time at the file size, and if it's not increasing anymore, you might be sure, okay, nobody's writing it anymore. Let's consider it as processed. Or you can just define a well-defined point in time. At midnight, 12 o'clock, typically this file is written. It must be available. We can read it safely. And all these options are at hand and must be in a portfolio when, when introducing a managed file transfer solution. Because typically, 
the ultimate file provider, some legacy system, doesn't allow you to, to change anything. It's there, you have no chance to do anything with that. The managed file transfer solution has to take care of that. It has to take care of file locking. It has to take care of file size monitoring of the atomic file movement and so on. And it's the same with the ultimate file consumer. By that, the file managed file transfer is not only about transferring file, it's really about making sure that the provider and consumer behave in a, in a well-defined manner. Then, of course, the transport is an important topic of the managed file transfer. It has to be guaranteed, 100% guaranteed, mostly <laughs> performant and reliable. It has to sometimes to be encrypted, archived and monitored, and ordered, reordered, controlled and auditable. And the managed file transfer has to take care of other properties too, like security, compliance, control and workflow integration. I go into a little bit more details in these. For instance, about the transport, there are several options and, and uh, the, a managed file transfer has to, has to offer. One is the, the most simple case is the local transport. It's just one host, copy move between directories, and maybe one host has several mount points, mounting several different file systems in there, so you have to take care of the file system idiosyncrasies and all these locking, unlocking, making sure the file is available at the right time has to be applied even in a local transport mode just to connect two processes that share data between, between them with files. Then we have host to host. That's a more typical scenario. One, one system is located in the source host, another in the target, and the file has to be moved between these. There are obvious protocols available like HTTP or FTP or some binary protocols. Anyhow, the managed file transfer system has to take care of managing the source and target destination, manage where the file has to be read and where it has to be written to. This information sometimes has to be in the metadata of the file that can be derived from the metadata that is transferred with the file where the final destination is, or it's upfront configured by convention, by content. This Setup is still a direct coupling of the source and the target. So the next evolution is to introduce a queuing-like system in between, between the source and the target. By that, the decoupling happens is, is in place. The source can be offline, the target can be offline, and the queuing system in between just makes sure that the files are getting delivered. This kind of setup is typically done um, to, to ensure reliable messaging or reliable tra file transfers. It has its weaknesses when it's coming to ordering, reordering files. By that, we introduce the concept of an intermediary. This is not only a queuing system, this is a managed file transfer setup, a combination of products that sits between the source and the target, and it, it provides storage to temporary store files or maybe longer for audit, and to manage the file transfer. Management means taking care of the ordering or reordering of files. There are some setups when a two leg or one legacy system writes a file A, a B, a C, but not in that order. They don't appear in that order in the file system. So an intermediary has to take care of the reordering based on a sliding time window when the file is getting reordered. Uh, intermediary is helpful for time delivery. So it can pick up the file at the source, so the source can go down for, for some time, and it can still deliver the file at 12 o'clock if the other legacy system demands it at 12, 12 o'clock. And of course, the uh, intermediary is very helpful for merging files. We see that quite often in, in the telco industry uh, when invoicing are getting sent out with PDFs. So there's one PDF about the invoice by itself, and another PDF with all these small, tiny um, statements of each and every call and stuff like that. And these PDF parts are typically created by different systems and they need to get merged somewhere. Security, of course, is a, 
huge matter in the managed file transfer. It, the, the most simple uh, requirement here is that the files are getting delivered to the entitled audience, of course. By that, the entire audience must, you must make sure that the managed file transfer is capable of taking care of the file system's um, entitlement system. It has sometimes to take care of malicious content by looking into the file. That can be a virus, though you have to be able to introduce a, a virus scanner, or it's just a malicious content can be uh, on the business side, not on purpose, but by accident that, for instance, some data in the file is corrupt and might d destroy the, the target system by that the file transfer system has to offer the option to look into a file and take action based on the content. This de denial of service attacks are very common in managed file transfers. Not that some evil hacker is introducing that it's just by accident. That some system is just has a bug inside or something happened. It creates millions of files with zero content. But then the managed file transfer system has to be aware of that, that this is not uh, expected and it should stop picking up these files and sending them. Or to creating two big files. We had that once that there were gigabyte, gigabyte by <laughs> sized files where we just expected kilobyte size. So you need a filter up front that you can filter out two big files and alert people. Blacklisting is an option sometimes when you know some, some systems and create files that are corrupt and there's no way to fix it. Uh, you just have to make sure that these files don't get processed or whitelisting the opposite. Compliancy is of course important too. It's about guaranteed delivery, timely delivery, auditing and logging, encryption and checksumming. All these capabilities must be provided by a managed file transfer system. The control, we already talked about that, it's all about processing order, delivery order, timing, routing, parallelizing, synchronizing. By that, sometimes a, a managed file transfer system can in parallel read files from the target system, but this, the destination system is only capable of processing a file one by, by another. So you have to, can parallelize the read process, but then you have to write it, the write, write it to the target system, wait until it's getting processed, it's gone, deleted, write the next one, write the next one. Routing is the same based on content, based on file name, based on encoding whatsoever. You must have means available to route the files based on, on content and, and on these properties. Workflow integration, as soon as you have to introduce long-running processes in a managed file transfer system, uh, you need workflows. When it's not only data-driven, it's, it's control-driven, a workflow system should be in place. This is typically the, the case if there are several subsystems that must be triggered asynchronously that takes a couple of seconds or minutes until you get the, the feedback from them or up to hours, or if a human task integration is necessary. Human task integration is sometimes necessary when a, real, a human being has to look at, for instance, a scan, if a scan didn't work well out, just to approve that this file is, is one that needs to, keep, to get pushed forward. So we talked now about all these requirements of a managed file transfer system, and as it's a Yellow Labs project, it's work in progress. Um, we started building that on top of WSL2 technology. On the right side, you see an kind of an uh, overview architecture of what, what we did so far and the products we used. We used WS2 ESBs, of course. <laughs> we used uh, with, with uh, VFS and our inbound file transfer. We used the WS2 message broker, um, the data analytics server for all kind of monitoring, and the business process server for long-running processes. In this architecture, you see on the left side at the source side is an ESB. That role is just to pick up the files and take care of that they get picked up and delivered either option one directly to the target system if there is no need for intermediary or via the intermediary that sometimes just uh, has the role of a store and forward or if it's getting more complex of reordering and auditing that takes care of that. And what we did so far is we set up this environment, we connected all the components and we prepared a whole lot of predefined in the WSO2 world proxies and configuration that all the system works together 
and that you have the capabilities of, let's say, a, a, a routing mechanism in there or a store and forward pattern. By that, that you don't have that um, that you don't have to implement that with several proxies. There will be a nice UI available where you can state, okay, this is the target, the source directory. This is, for instance, the rec expression of the file name, and this is the target directory. And we want that guaranteed. And if you check the, the, the checkbox guaranteed, it goes through the intermediary, it creates the appropriate queues, and delivers it. This is our, the, the, the key features of what we did so far. Routing based on name and content, push and pull methods on several protocols based on VFS, guaranteed delivery and retry, archiving of, of files, sometimes we just archive the checksum, detection of double file input, single source, multiple targets, determining the sending order of the files to the target, monitoring and alerting options. Monitoring and uh, alerting is uh, quite interesting. We right now work on a CEP uh, implementation that not only if something goes wrong with a file, but to, to answer these questions, we expect every hour one file of that size, and if that doesn't pop up, then we do some, some alerting. And this is quite challenging to determine something that's not happening. Yes, someone has to take care of that. The current status is this runtime, this predefined proxies, the templates are done. Of course, they will never be done as there's always new requirements coming in. The user phase is work in progress right now to provide this convenient way of, of applying these uh, requirements of the specific implementation. We are extensively testing on various file systems. That is a huge challenge because you quite often don't have these file systems, especially from in a legacy world. Amazon Web Services is doing a great job there, but we are really looking into a way to, to identify all these file systems so that we can test it. And we, we aim to launch the full solution end of 2016. Of course, part of that solutions are already in production, but not with that shiny nice UI. Remaining challenges, of course, there are a lot of them. Uh, for instance, one is chunking of large files through a message broker, where you have to chunk the large file, make small pieces of it, route it through a message broker get them together and guarantee that that works and is fast and that no chunks are faster than the other ones and files, several files are getting processed in parallel so that's a, a challenge. Streaming of large files is typically it's not a problem if there's one target and one source system but if there are several intermediaries in between maintaining that th stream through all of them is, is pretty challenging. And the individual file system implementations and their properties, that's, that's a huge challenge to, to, to be aware of it, to understand what, what's happening in there. And what we find out, especially in, 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 uh, with the ESB, with the VFS, there's a, a JSIF library inside taking care of, of uh, Microsoft file systems. And if that library is outdated and quite uh, some, some releases behind the latest, greatest version, you don't you, you quite often end in, in problems with the latest file system somewhere in place. That it, it, yeah, it, it should be always up to date with that, that library. And the de deduction of file encoding, that, that's something we're working on now too. Um, just that you don't have, or that you have the chance to deduct the, the file encoding, but that's not, not solved at all. And as a final note, uh, to cite Andrew Tenenbaum, Never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurtling down the highway. So this sending a, f uh, sending a disk to somebody is sometimes a managed file transfer too. Amazon offers that. You can send to Amazon disks that, uh, to, to upload data. So it's not an artificial example. It's happening in the real world. So thanks for your attention and happy for, for your questions. Nobody? I have a question. Who is using file transfers? <laughs> and who has, uh, let's say, in a positive way, 
uh, a lot of challenges still today with file transfer. It's that, okay, it's, it's, it's really the, the question if, or from our side as an integration specialist, we anticipated this as a, as a market, yeah? It, it will be there in five years and in 10 years with all microservices around. We do that too, of course, we like them. But files, we have the, we ha we have the impression that files are treated like a legacy monster. Nobody wants to really take care of it. And we think it, it should be a first class citizen in an integration platform. So if, uh, get your hands if you agree on that or, okay, yeah. Okay, so thanks.